Engines in a car work by taking the fuel, typically gasoline and air, the oxygen in the air actually, and you put it into a mixture. And now we're going to rearrange those bonds into a more stable state. If you could combust it completely, it would all turn into water vapor and carbon dioxide and liberate energy. That energy would manifest itself as the motion of the carbon dioxide and water molecules. They get hot. So imagine I have this cylinder and I've just exploded my gasoline air mixture. Well, at that moment, the volume hasn't moved yet. Things don't move instantaneously. But since my temperature has gone way up, my pressure has gone way up. Once again, pressure times volume is proportional to temperature. In this case, the volume instantaneously hasn't moved. The pressure has gone up because the temperature has gone up. Since one side of this can move and we have a high pressure in it, sure enough, the power stroke of a four cycle engine will push the cylinder down. And that's the basis of your car moving because the bottom of that cylinder is connected to a rod, the rod is connected to a crankshaft, the crankshaft is designed in a very clever way such that this up and down motion of the piston makes a circular motion of the crankshaft connected to the wheels. Great, we have a power stroke. We've blown up the exhaust, the mixture, we filled the thing with exhaust, it's down in its bottom. What do you do? Hmm. Well, you know, I want this engine to work more than just once. So, you know, I think I better put an opening in it, a valve. And this valve will open just at the right time so I can take the piston and move it back up and push all that exhaust out through that exhaust valve. That's called the exhaust stroke because I've exhausted the used gases. Okay, now I have an empty cylinder. Got to put gasoline and air back into it. The other valve in the engine, the intake valve, will now open. The piston will go down, sucking in this air and gasoline mixture. Or maybe we'll use a fuel injector. And the fuel injector will trigger just at this point, injecting in a mixture of air and gasoline. This stroke, which brings the fuel into the engine, is called the intake stroke. We've gone through three cycles so far. Power, exhaust, intake. We're all ready to blow it up, but it's not going to do us any good. Because if I ignited the spark plug at this point, the cylinder is already at its maximum volume. We're not going to get any advantage out of that. In fact, your car will knock. Oh, I hear that knocking in the car. Well, that's because the power strokes have gone off at the wrong time when the cylinder is already all the way open or moving the wrong direction. So we need one more stroke, the important one, the compression stroke. This gas and air mixture that's in the full open cylinder will now get compressed up to the point where we're about to ignite the spark plug. There's a thing in automobiles or any kind of engines called compression ratio. It's the ratio between the volume when it's all the way open, when the cylinder is as big as possible, and the volume when it's in the smallest possible. That ratio tells you something about how powerful the engine is, how much energy it can produce in a given amount of time. The higher the compression ratio, the more powerful an engine. So we have the cylinder compressed. Both valves are closed. They have to be closed during the compression strike because otherwise you just push the gas back out. That'd be pretty useless, right? So these are closed. The spark plug goes off, boom, you get another power stroke. Four different cycles, a four cycle engine. And that's why most of the smallest cars you have will have at least four cylinders. So each cylinder can be going through one of these strokes at a time. Always one cylinder will be doing its power stroke. They're all connected to the same crankshaft, driving the same wheels, so that residual motion from one of them going through a power stroke will move the pistons up and down for the other strokes. It is possible to have fewer cylinders. You just hope that the inertia is enough to pump in and out the gas and to compress the fuel. <coughs> 
I should mention a two-cycle engine. Motorcycles, chainsaws, leaf blowers, small portable engines you can carry around with you are two-cycle engines. They basically have a power stroke and they have a compression stroke. So how does the gas get out? How does the fuel get in? Well, they cheat. So you got the power stroke. They open a valve real quick. The pressure of the gas that's still in the cylinder is enough for a lot of it, not all of it, a lot of the exhaust to come out. At the same time, they squirt in more fuel, right? They kind of squirt it in a liquid and you got some air. So, so you, boom, you got your power stroke. Valves open, lets the exhaust out, squirts it in, and it's starting to compress, starting to come back up. They close the valves. You get the rest of the compression. Are they as efficient? Generally, you haven't gotten rid of all the exhaust. You probably lost a little bit of the fuel, right? You probably haven't taken full advantage of the cooling from the oil and the lubrication, so you got to put a little oil in the gas. But instead of making a power once every four times, they're making a power on every other stroke. Every time the piston goes down, it makes power. So actually, if you control it and manage things just right, the efficiency of the engine can, is not that bad because it's always making power. And clearly, it can be lighter weight since you don't have to rely on it going up and down and up and down and having some inertia behind it. So now that we know something about how an automobile engine works, there's all sorts of terms that people who really are into their cars talk about. And I just want to make sure that you know what those terms are too. And so when somebody says, I've got like overhead cams and 32 valves, and a Hemi, you know exactly what they're talking about. You may not care what they're talking about, <laughs> and you may think that they're not anyone you necessarily want to deal with, but this way at least you will know what they're saying and why. So let's start with a few of those terms. A Hemi, short for hemisphere, means that the top of the cylinder, instead of being flat, is rounded to a hemispherical shape. Why would you do that other than being able to say a cool word? Well, a domed shape, of course, can take more pressure than a flat shape. So maybe you can now cut your engine out of a bit less metal because it's stronger with that domed shape on top. So the whole engine might be a bit lighter. But that's what a hemi is. It's a hemispherical top of a cylinder. Camshafts. A cam is a rounded uh, object with a flat side. And as your engine circles around, this cam also turns. When it hits the flat side, a shaft, a rod that connects to it, now does not lift up a spring. So in, especially older engines that have camshafts, are basically rods that open the valves at the right time. Timing. How do you know when the spark plug is supposed to go off? Clearly it needs an electronic signal. There's a belt, at least in the older types of cars, a timing belt that times when the signal goes to the spark plug each time. And that, of course, is also driven by the same drive shaft, so the timing is always just right on your car. And, of course, if the timing is off, you'll get the knocks, you'll get the explosions happening when the cylinder is in the wrong position. Valves. Every cylinder needs two valves. Of course, if you put four valves into the cylinder, you can get the exhaust out faster, more efficiently, and you can get the fuel in faster, more efficiently. So if you have an eight-cylinder engine with 32 valves written on the side of the car, you have four valves per cylinder instead of two. Sizes of engines. They used to be done in the United States in cubic inches. And everyone know when you have like a, a 450 cubic inch engine. My first car, that's my dad's, right? First one I got to drive on a regular basis was a 1968 Thunderbird. 
at 527 cubic inches. It was a monster of a car, a V8, eight huge cylinders. Got a whole eight miles per gallon. Gasoline was cheap. That 527 cubic inches is the total, quote, displacement, the total, the total volume of all of the cylinders put together. So imagine that if I have a very large region that can explode the gasoline, a lot of gasoline because it's a very big volume to fill up, I can get a lot more power out. So this displacement is a measure of how powerful the engine is. A bigger cylinder can produce more force, therefore can produce more power. Somewhere along the line, especially when gasoline started going way up in price in the 1970s, they had to decide to start making much smaller engines. But everyone remembers, wow, a small engine was like the, the 305, and you had the 350s and the 450s. So they changed the metric. They started measuring displacement in liters. A liter is 61 cubic inches. So my 527, you divided that by 61, that's like eight and a half liters. That's an enormous engine, right? Even my Trans Am that I have at home today is a six liter engine, that's still pretty big. You'll see many things that are a 1.3 liter engine. That's like, what, only 100 cubic inches or something? No one would ever bought that, but 1.3 liters. Oh, well, that sounds good. It's fuel efficient. That's right. Smaller displacement uses less fuel, produces less power. But if your whole car weighs less, that's fine. That 68 T-Bird had solid iron I-beams on all sides of it, all right? Cars have gone way down in mass, and they don't need as powerful of an engine to really have good performance. So. What are some other things about cars? We've got the displacement. What about getting the air into the cylinder? If I got that air in faster, my whole engine could run faster. So I could ram it in. So something with ram air means exactly that. You've got a, an opening in front of your car, you're going at 60 miles per hour, air is being rammed into that, and if that air channel actually connects into your cylinders, you now have ram air, because you're ramming the air into the cylinder. Of course, sometimes you just see that for looks on the front of a car and it doesn't go anywhere, but you know, in many cars it really does. The next thing is turbocharging. What if I really want to pump that air in so I have a little fan, a little turbine, shooting it in even more? That's a turbocharger. Well, we've been on a great job about talking about T-hot, the heat into the engine, getting the air in. Maybe getting the exhaust out. But what about cooling it? This is very important because if you don't cool your engine, it gets hotter and hotter with each cycle. When you see something that says so many revolutions per minute, that's how many times the cylinder is going up and down. Something that's running at 2,000 RPM really means it's got 2,000 of these revolutions per minute. That's a lot. We better be taking that waste heat away. And that's what the oil does in your engine. The oil cools the cylinder. In the cylinder itself, there are little grooves called rings, and the oil is pumped into those, and every time the cylinder goes up and down, it's leaving a very thin film of oil along it. But most importantly, that oil is taking the temperature, the heat from inside that cylinder away. So your oil gets hot. So you gotta cool the oil. Well, there's another loop in your car that has water, or a mixture of water and antifreeze. Now, it doesn't actually mix with the oil, but it goes through a heat exchanger, tubes that interlace with each other. So the water gets hot and the oil gets a bit cooler. So now I got a bunch of hot water, probably even under quite some pressure. I need to cool it. Well, I'm gonna cool it with air. This is what goes to the radiator. The cooling water goes to the radiator. A fan, driven by the fan belt, cools the radiator. It also helps that the radiator is in the front of your car, so as you're driving down the street, you have a whole bunch of air with your plowing through, going through your radiator. When your car overheats, it's usually because either some channel in the radiator is plugged up, or your fan belt broke or stopped, and you are no longer cooling off 
the water. If you're not cooling off the water, it's not cooling off the oil. If you're not cooling off the oil, it's not cooling off the engine. Your temperature of your engine goes way up and you better stop your car. Because if you don't, the engine temperature could get so high that the metal will actually start to melt. And of course, if I now have a cylinder going up and down, and there's another thing, and they're both melting, what happens when you melt two pieces of metal together? It's called welding. <laughs> That's what happens to your engine. It no longer goes up and down, it welds itself together and it seizes. And that's really bad. When that happens, of course, maybe some of the other cylinders are still working, so they're still turning the crankshaft. That rod that was connected to that cylinder, piston that was supposed to go up and down in the cylinder, isn't moving anywhere because it just got welded together, so that rod will break and go flying through the rest of your engine. That's called throwing a rod. Not good things for your car. That's kind of what happened to my 68 Thunderbird. So keep oil in your engine. Keep clean oil in your engine because dirty oil will, of course, not do as good of a job cooling it and will eventually clog up all of the things that are supposed to filter the oil and make the oil be able to transfer from heat one place to another. Keep water in your radiator. In the winter, when your car is just sitting there, if the water in your radiator froze into solid ice, ice expands, it breaks the channels, and that's bad too. So you got to put antifreeze in, and antifreeze also helps at the high temperature end as well. And that's what you need to know about the internal combustion engine.